Hello everyone, welcome to our online science festival, Curious About Our Planet. I'm Patrick from Glasgow Science Centre and our guest for this session is Catherine from the Marine Conservation Society. Today, Catherine will be talking to us about Scottish seas and there will be plenty of time for questions. So feel free to write those in the chat box on YouTube and we will try and get through those as quickly as we possibly can. But for now, it is over to you, Catherine. Morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm so excited to be talking to you about our wonderful ocean. So today we're going to go through a little bit about what I do with the Marine Conservation Society. And more importantly, let's talk about some of the amazing creatures that live there. And I'm looking forward to answering all of your amazing questions as well. So we'll get started. So I do work for a charity called the Marine Conservation Society. So hopefully you see my little crab friend walking across our logo here. We work all over the UK, but I work in our Scotland team. So I live up in Forres and Murray, but actually coming to you live from Edinburgh in our office um, in the capital city, which a lot of people forget is actually a seaside city itself. And we're so lucky in Scotland to have such amazing coastline, beaches and amazing sea creatures. So this is home for me. This is my local beach. This is Fintorn up in Murray. And I'm sure lots of you have favorite beaches maybe that are near you or from holidays or from family that you go to visit. We've got so many lovely beaches across Scotland. And this is me in the sea. So I absolutely love swimming in the sea, love paddling. It's a little bit cold in Scotland. I don't know if you've been in the sea before. It's a little bit chilly. So here's me in my wetsuit and my bobble hat so I could go out and enjoy the water in the winter as well as the summer. Now, I'm also a STEM ambassador, which is why I'm so excited to be working with the Glasgow Science Centre this morning. So this means I try and champion and tell everyone how amazing science, technology, engineering and maths subjects are especially because when I was at school, I wasn't very good at science, but now I'm working in a job where I use science to help save the sea. So it doesn't matter what you're interested in or what you're good at, you can get involved in science and help save our precious planet. And being curious about our planet is definitely the first best step. And of course, I work for the Marine Conservation Society. My official job title is Scotland Conservation Officer. So I work all over Scotland. I get to visit loads of schools and different communities. I work with politicians and government and try and do everything I can to save Scotland's amazing sea. So let's talk about the sea, Scotland's amazing sea. Sometimes all we ever see is the top of it and it's this big blue, gray, turquoise mass. And we have to think about, but what's actually beneath the waves? What's underneath those crashing waves that you see coming across the shore? Here are some of the amazing creatures that live just underneath those waves. So what you can do is pop in the chat any sea creatures that you can actually spot in here that you know the name of. And Patrick, I wonder, are there any on there that you recognize at all? I think I'm right in saying I can see a starfish. You're right, the starfish right in the middle. That's one of my favorite creatures to find, especially when we go rock pooling and have a look at all those pools that are left behind when the tide comes out. Now, starfish are actually one of my favorite creatures because of the way they eat their lunch. It's a little bit disgusting. So our starfish, they love to eat mussels. So everyone show me your mussels. Now, don't, don't worry, it's not these mussels that they like to eat. It's the mussels that are in blue shells that you sometimes find on the beach. And what our starfish does is it uses its thousands of little feet underneath those legs, crawls around the rock pool, and when it finds a mussel, it gives it a giant hug. And then it sticks all of its feet to the mussel, and then it starts pulling the mussel apart. It's really strong. It breaks open the shell and goes crack. And then it's got that little soft muscle inside. And what it does next is it is sick all over its food. It goes bleh and throws up its stomach and it starts to dissolve and digest the muscle. And then it goes and sucks it all back in. Now, I don't think any of us would like to eat our lunch like that, would we? Ugh, definitely not. But so many of our sea creatures have adapted to be able to live in their environment, live in their habitat and in the sea. And for our starfish, they've adapted to have those really strong feet and to be able to digest and eat their food outside of their body. They've got lots of suggestions coming in. 
I wonder if it's anyone spotted one of my favorite sea creatures at the top, which is the basking shark. So this is the world's second largest fish. It's probably the size of maybe some of your school buses. And it comes to Scotland every summer to hoover up plankton, some of the teeniest, tiny animals and plants in the ocean. And that's why it's got that massive, big open mouth to hoover up all of that plankton. Now, I'm really lucky in that I'm actually a scuba diver as well. So I can actually go underneath the waves with some of my friends to see some of these creatures. We've got to put a big tank on our back. We've got to put our masks on. And we also have to put what's called a regulator in our mouth to breathe. And we sound a little bit like Darth Vader, like... <laughs> but that does mean we wouldn't be able to talk like I'm talking to you just now. It would just all be bubbles. So I wonder, does anyone know how divers talk underwater? How about we think, how would you talk underwater? That's right, we use our hands. We use hand signals to talk to each other underwater. So if I was to show this hand signal, I'm just asking if you're okay. And it'd be a question and an answer. So this is one we use a lot. It's like, are you okay, you having a good time? Yeah, I'm fine, this is really good. But the most exciting ones are for sea creatures. So the one for shark is really easy. If you just take one hand and make it nice and straight like this, put it on top of your head, and that's the dive signal for shark. Now there's a creature on here that's actually one of our really special visitors that's not in this picture, and it's called the leatherback sea turtle. Did you know turtles came to Scotland as well? They actually come to eat some of the creatures on this photo, which are the jellyfish. Now the jellyfish signal is really easy. If you just kind of let your hand hang loose like this and do that, that's the hand signal for a jellyfish. And our turtles come along to gobble them up. And the turtle one's my favorite. If you put both your hands out in front of you like this, one on top of the other, and then either leave all your fingers out like that, or you can group them all together and leave your thumbs out, roll your thumbs. And that's the underwater symbol for turtle. So something you can maybe have a go of later is seeing what other sea creatures you can name. See if you can come up with your own dive signal for some of these amazing creatures and start helping other people get curious about the sea, what's in there, and see all this amazing wildlife that's there. But what we're going to talk about next is what can we do to help some of these amazing visitors and creatures that live in Scotland seas, as sadly, they are under a little bit of threat, but there's something that we can all do as well as learning about them, we can take action to help protect them as well. So what do we do at the Marine Conservation Society? Well, one of the big parts of my job is to do beach cleans. Now, I wonder if we've got a few beach cleaners in the audience, has anyone done a beach clean before? We've usually got quite a lot of beach cleaners. Well, thank you so much if you've done one before. And if not, let me tell you how we run our beach cleans. So this picture shows a nice drawing of a beach and you'll see there's two flags and that's marking out 100 meters. So about 100 big steps of beach and you'll see there's some litter on there. So what our volunteers do is they go down to their local beach, they mark out 100 meters and as well as picking up all of that rubbish with their litter pickers, they fill in one of our survey forms. So they actually become citizen scientists. So at the beginning, when we talked about anyone can get involved in science, this is something that you can all do. And you can all become citizen scientists and count all the litter that you would find on a beach cleat, or if you maybe live next to a park or a river or on your street or even in your playground, you can do a survey to find out what litter is around. And this is then the next really important part of my job, I use all of that information to see if we can get items of litter like this, plastic forks, cutlery, there's cigarette ends, there's wet wipes, there's plastic bags. We're trying to see if we can stop them getting into the sea and washing up on the beach in the first place. And this is what we do then with that information. We make big maps. We then share all that information with people like the Scottish government, with other scientists, with businesses, to see if we can get them to change the law or change their ways to stop all of that litter entering into the sea. Now it was World Ocean Day yesterday. So the whole world was celebrating the ocean. And you know what, in Scotland, it actually celebrated one week of Scotland banning a lot of those single-use plastic items. So single-use plastic forks and cups and spoons and plates. And that was all thanks 
to citizen scientists like you helping collect all that data, all that information, all that counting on the beach. We couldn't have changed that law if it wasn't for those amazing volunteers and citizen scientists. So I wonder if anybody knows who this is. So obviously the famous person in that photo is Stuart, our leatherback turtle. Can anyone remember the dive signal for turtle? Are you doing it? That's right. So that's how big leatherback turtles can grow. They're absolutely huge and they need to be nice and big so they can stay nice and warm when they come to visit our chilly waters. And next to Stuart is the First Minister Nicola Sturgeon. So she is at the top of the Scottish government. So it's her job to pass new laws to help save the sea. And it's only thanks to people like you getting curious about the sea, finding out about it, what can you do to help to protect it? And then telling people like politicians, like the First Minister, what they can do to help protect it. And it was then Nicola Sturgeon who can bring in these new laws to stop all of this plastic and other items getting onto the beach and saving creatures like Stuart the leatherback turtle. So hopefully you've got lots of ideas in your head now about your favorite sea creature, maybe your favorite beach, and maybe some ideas about what you want to do to help protect our ocean. So here's some of the ideas that I got from some of the people that I work with. They said it's really good if we can try to reduce, reuse and recycle whenever you can. Now, I wonder for reducing how many of you have a reusable water bottle that you maybe fill up every day to take to school. Or maybe you've got a packed lunchbox that you use again and again. So that's helping to reduce single use plastic that you might just use once and throw away. And reusing items again and again is one of the best ways to help save the ocean. And then of course, if you can't reuse it, to make sure to recycle it. So that's a fantastic thing that you, your family and everyone at home and at school can do. Maybe you could get a bit creative and create a marine display in your classroom. Working in marine conservation means I get to work with so many different people, including artists, including musicians, to try and get people curious about the sea so they want to take action to protect it. So if you're really good at art, maybe you could try and help save the sea that way. Maybe you're a bit of a chatterbox. Do you really like talking? Tell your friends and family about everything that you've learned today. Teach them the signal for turtle or get them to come up with their own. So many people don't realize how much amazing wildlife we have living under the sea in Scotland. So you can help save it just by talking about it. And if you'd like to do some more lessons in school, we've got our website, we've got our Cool Seas Explorer Centre with loads of games and different things that you can do as a class to maybe learn more about our ocean and what else you can do to help protect it. And if you can, some of the best ways to do it is to visit the beach and visit the sea, or because we know so much of the litter comes from inland, if you live next to a river or a canal or even the drains in your street, they can all connect to the sea. So you can head out, pick up litter, collect that data and become a citizen scientist to stop all of that litter working its way down into the ocean. So we'll say cheerio from our little crab friend and his dive signal is his pincers. So you can do his pincers to wave goodbye to the crab. And I'm excited to hear some of your amazing questions. Oh, thank you so much, Catherine. That was so great. And I learned so much uh, listening to your presentation there. So I'm sure everyone watching did as well. Although I don't think I'm going to eat my lunch like a starfish today. That's maybe a step too far. Um, I'm sure there's lots and lots of questions ready to come in. Um, so when we're ready, we'll get the first question up. Here we are. Oh, this is a good one to start. Catherine, what is your favorite sea creature? And are there any that have given you a big fright? <laughs> That's such a good question. So for me, it's always so difficult to choose. I think it changes every single day what my favorite sea creature is. But we've already talked about basking sharks and turtles and starfish. So I think the one I'm going to answer this question is it's called a nudibranch, which is a bit of a strange name, but they're sea slugs. And you know, we actually get hundreds of different kinds of sea slugs, but they look so different to the garden ones. They're really brightly colored. They're purple and pink and yellow and green. And there's actually ones that look like little sheep and that look like little rabbits. So I would definitely encourage everyone afterwards to look up the sea slugs and see if you can find the one that looks like a little sea sheep. But I have to admit, they're not overly frightening. But the one that's probably given me a bit of a fright is when I've been snorkeling 
and you snorkel over all the rocks and the seaweed and it's quite hard sometimes to see. And sometimes when I'm snorkeling, I'll turn a corner and then all of a sudden there'll be a massive fish right in front of me. And there's a type of fish called a wrasse and they are so friendly that they come up and they actually nibble your mask. They're trying to look for lots of lovely things to eat. But sometimes that can be a, give you a bit of a fright when you're not expecting it. You turn around a corner of seaweed and there's this wrasse and he starts nibbling on your mask as well. But there's so many sea creatures that you don't need to be frightened of at all. When I was snorkeling with basking sharks, they were so amazing and didn't need to be scared at all. Wow. Because when we think of sharks, we think of them being quite scary, don't we? So why were why were the Baskin sharks so friendly? Were they interested in you? you yeah, and attention? again, they're so big and we're so small as well. They're almost just like ignoring us. It's almost like us batting off a fly. They're just like, no, oh, you're just a little human and you're not tasty. We don't want to eat you. <laughs> I think a lot of people sometimes are scared of sharks. And I think that's because of different things we've maybe seen in films or on the telly. But there's quite a sad fact that we actually as humans kill more sharks than sharks would ever hurt us as well, which kind of shows that they need our protection as well. So if you're lucky enough ever to see a shark, it's actually a really amazing thing. But we've always just got to remember we're going into their home, so we have to respect it. So that's why we have to make sure we keep it clean and we always make sure that they have the space they need in their sea. Because if a shark came to visit you in your house, you wouldn't like them just charging in and then lying on the sofa without asking your permission. No, definitely not. I think we have another question from somebody else. This is from Pam Collins. Thank you very much, Pam. Uh, how much litter do you collect each day? Good question. Oh, that's a really good question, Pam. So we've got thousands of volunteers across Scotland who collect litter for us every day through our beach cleaning programs. And um, some beaches are really clean and they don't pick up very much. Others, we find literally thousands of items of litter per beach. There is a beach that I used to clean in Edinburgh called Cramond, and we picked up over five and a half thousand wet wipes in just a hundred meters. So depending on what beach you go to depends on the type of litter that you find and how much of it, which is why we need as many citizen scientists as possible. So we know the full picture and how much litter is actually out there and how much sadly can still just come in on every tide as well. Five and a half thousand is a crazy amount of litter. So much, piles and piles of them. So yeah, it just shows that sometimes a beach can look clean. And then when you start looking and start looking in amongst the seaweed, how much can start coming out as well? Yeah, you've definitely got me inspired to start uh, a beach watch and go on litter picking. Um, and a bit to help. Um, I think we've got another question coming up. This is another uh, from YouTube from Mandana. Thank you very much. Oh, good question. What is the dolphin sign? Oh, that's a great one. There's quite a lot of different ones for dolphin, but the one I usually use is this one. So that's how the action they usually do for kind of like jumping through the water. And I'm very lucky living up in the Murray Firth. We've got a residential population of bottlenose dolphins. And I'm pleased to say they are officially the fattest dolphins in the world because they're the ones who live the furthest north. So they need that thick layer of blubber, that thick layer of fat to keep them nice and warm. But it means they're really big, so they're a little bit easier to spot. <laughs> And how big are those dolphins? Could we see them from the shore up there? Or? Easily. So I've seen them from the beach. I've actually been lucky enough. Two weeks ago, I was out paddle boarding and a pod of dolphins swam past us when we were paddle boarding, which was amazing. Wow. You quite often can see dolphins and porpoise as well in both the Clyde and the Forth all along the East Coast. And the West Coast, you might even be lucky enough to see orca and to see the killer whale as well. Wow. I'll be keeping my eyes out, that's for sure. Definitely. <laughs> I think we've got another question Oh, from Miss Urquhart. Hello. Uh, is it true that there is a certain type of turtle that you can see its heart? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Not that I'm aware of. So we've got seven different species of marine turtle. We only tend to get the leatherback that comes to visit us here because it's the only one that can cope with the cold water. We sometimes get loggerhead turtles washing up, but it's usually because they've got a little bit lost. So they're a bit cold. So we have to rescue them, warm them up and help pop them back, whether it's over to the Caribbean or down to Africa and um, to where they're going. And most of them will have that kind of hard shell on their back. We call it a carapace. And that will also extend to cover their tummy and everything as well. 
but I will definitely find out. We've got Dr. Turtle who works for us, Dr. Peter Richardson, who has worked with turtles for a very long time. So that's definitely a question I'll have to ask him. So if you maybe follow our Twitter or our social media, I'll see if you can post the question and the answer on there. And we'll find out if there is one that can see its heart maybe through its shell. Yeah, it's a brilliant question. We'll see if, if we can do something to get that answer to you as well, Ms. Urquhart. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we've got another question ready to go. It's from Heather Nickel. And this is a question from Van Tasken. I hope I said that right. Primary five and six. Hello, and thank you for watching. Oh, what is your least favorite sea creature? None of them. They're all amazing. <laughs> Let's have we think. What would be my least favorite sea creature? So... I think it's probably not one in particular, but it's a good thing to talk about is when we talk about invasive species. So this is sadly when different types of sea creatures turn up basically where they're not supposed to. So and usually when an invasive species come into an area, they then kind of knock out all of what we call the native species or the species that are supposed to live there. And that's their home. And sadly, we're seeing it happening a lot in the sea now with climate change. The ocean is starting to warm up. So that means creatures, including species like jellyfish, are now starting to move further north. And then when they swarm together, it means they can block out maybe sunlight or food or the space that other creatures need to then survive as well. So I think it probably my least favorite sea creature would be an invasive species where they're not supposed to be. That makes a lot of sense, yeah, because we're seeing a lot of that, aren't we? The creatures sort of ending up where they're not supposed to. And, it's, and sometimes you, see, you hear about whales in the Thames in London, and I, I'm not sure that's climate change related, but it happens It could be. It yeah. is, isn't it? And you hear it on land, a lot of, um, probably the most common one in Scotland is maybe the red squirrel. That's obviously our native species. And then the grey squirrel is the invasive one that's come in and is kind of stronger, which means our reds are now struggling. So we see that happening all the time in the sea. And it's not just sea creatures, it's things like seaweeds as well. So we'll get invasive species, seaweeds that have maybe been attached to boats that have come in, they've not washed off their hull properly. And these new seaweeds come in and then they just take over a little bit like weeds in your garden, um, which is really bad because if we lose our native species, it's really hard then to get them back. But we are working to restore a lot of them. You might hear a lot about rewilding or restoring nature. And we're actually trying to do that in Scotland with seagrass, which is basically grass mm -hmm. under the sea. Um, and native oysters as well. So there is something we can do, but it's better if we can make sure we protect what we have first. I think we've actually got some um, something about rewilding on the Curious About site, if people want to check that out and learn more about rewilding, so that'd be great. And um, could we have another question, please? Oh, from Pam again. Uh, Philip wants to know, hello, Philip. Uh, what is the most fascinating creature you've ever found? Oh, Philip, that's a great one. And the one that comes to mind is probably one of my favorite kind of snorkeling experiences. I was on a dive trip up in Orkney at a place called Scapa Flows. There's lots of shipwrecks. We were going to dive shipwrecks. I decided to take the afternoon off and just stayed on the boat. And then two porpoise, so they're kind of part of the dolphin family, the little dolphins, and started following the boat. So I decided to go in the water and one of them came really, really close to me. And it was really fascinating because he was turning on his side and he was really looking at me and he kept swimming away and coming back. And he was just really close swimming around me. And it was amazing. It was almost like we were doing this underwater dance, but just seeing the intelligence in his eyes and being like, why are you in my home? Um, was absolutely amazing. <laughs> Do we have a sign for a porpoise? I'm putting you on the spot here. <laughs> oh, well, do you know what? It would probably have to just be a really little dolphin sign, wouldn't oh. it, for a porpoise? Because they're just little, they look like little baby dolphins. Brilliant. I think we've got yet another question. Thank you so much, everyone, for getting these in. It's fantastic. Uh, this is from Gemma Wood. Do the turtles get stung when eating the jellyfish? What a great question. That's a really good question. So when we looked at sea creatures earlier, we were talking about how creatures adapt. So the starfish have adapted to have those sticky feet and being able to eat those mussels. So turtles have adapted. So when they eat jellyfish, their throat is actually covered in spines and spikes. So they look quite scary if you're able to look down a leatherback turtle's throat. But they're not hard spines. They're made of cartilage. So the stuff at the end of your nose and in your ears but it protects them then from getting stung and also helps them eat the jellyfish. Don't know if you can imagine what it'd be like to eat a jellyfish, be very slippy and slidey, trying to hold it all together. So these spikes then make sure it stays down. But then it's also quite difficult then if they're starting to come across maybe litter that has ended up in the ocean, especially things like plastic bags, they look very much like a floating jellyfish. So if they get stuck on the spikes that are great for keeping jellyfish down, 
They're sadly then great for keeping that plastic down as well, which isn't good. And sadly, our creatures can't adapt fast enough to how much we're putting in the ocean. So if we can stop it getting there, it means our turtles can just concentrate on eating jellyfish and not getting stung because of their spikes. Another great reason for us to all go out litter picking. So all teachers watching, let's organize a class trip out to the beach and get picking up some litter. I think we've got another question from Ailey. Hello, Ailey. How many people go diving with you? So you said, I think you said you went scuba diving, didn't you? So That's right. So yeah, Ailey. So I learned to dive when I was at university in Aberdeen and we had a whole dive club. So there would sometimes be up to 20 of us going out on a dive trip. But most of the time when you're going diving, you'll have one or two buddies is what you call them. You have a buddy to go with you underwater. And that means you can just keep each other safe. But it also means you can both then enjoy what you're seeing. You can talk to each other and show each other all these amazing dive signals of the things that you find. Um, and then sometimes you'll then all meet up at the end to go back up to the surface together. But it's always good to go diving with a friend. Um, and so see if you can find your dive buddy. That sounds like a great idea. I think we have time for one more question. Thank you so much for everybody that sent them in. That is fantastic. And it's from Miss Arkar again. And it's, oh, another great question. Which fish can live the longest? Oh, that's a great question, Miss Arkar. So what a lot of people don't realize are sharks are part of the fish family. They are just giant fish. And there is a species of shark called the Greenland shark. And I think the latest study has shown that these sharks can live hundreds of years because they live in really cold waters. They live really deep. They also live very much life in the slow lane. They take it very relaxed, very chilled out. But how amazing that there's creatures out there who have lived for over uh, well over 100 years, maybe some of them even a couple of hundred years. But what's amazing is marine scientists every day are discovering something new. And that's what's amazing. Our ocean is so big, it's so deep, it's so diverse and different that maybe one of you might grow up to be that scientist who will discover a creature that's lived for thousands of years. Who knows? That's fantastic, Catherine. Oh, I think we could have spoken for about an hour here today just learning all about the, the seas, in particular Scottish seas. But that's been such a great session. Thank you for answering all of our questions so brilliantly. And hopefully we can speak together again sometime. Um, thank thank you. you so much to everyone uh, watching, whether you're at school or you're at home. It's been absolutely fantastic having you all. Uh, you can see more of our content on the Curious About website at Glasgow Science Centre. And we've got another session coming up about the Countryside Ranger Service. So we hope we can see you for that one as well. Until then, uh, I've been Patrick. Thank you very much for watching and we will see you later. Goodbye.